When I was pregnant with my son Joshua, I gained 70 pounds and was eager to start working out again. On October 17th, 2002, the day my OBGYN released me, I called my husband Rob and begged him to meet me at the YMCA so that I could walk on the treadmill while he watched the children. When I pulled into the parking lot, I saw an ambulance and a team of people surrounding a body under a white sheet. I said a little prayer to myself for the family of the person who died. I parked my car and took my four-year-old Micah by the hand and my baby Joshua stayed in his infant car seat. I handed my card to the woman behind the counter who swiped my ID and said, oh my God, this is his wife. It was exactly 13 years ago today that a team of police officers surrounded me and one said, ma'am, I'm sorry, but your husband died here today. Rob was a mechanical engineer and a minister in training. He loved God with all of his heart. He was 6'2", 180 pounds, 41 years old. He was also boyish at his core. Um, when, uh, when I learned what killed him, a massive heart attack, I couldn't believe it because he was so vibrant and healthy. He exercised three days a week and was an avid walker. I later learned that 20% of people who have a heart attack have zero cardiac risk factors. My husband died of something called atherosclerosis, which is a buildup of plaque in, inside of the arteries that bring blood to the heart. A vulnerable plaque ruptured, formation of a blood clot ensued, which plugged the artery so that blood could not flow to the prime real estate of the heart. He died of something called a widow maker. I later learned that he had severe blockage in three of his coronary vessels. He was a walking time bomb. Now, one out of three Americans suffer from heart disease. Improving lifestyles, use of medication, and operations have reduced the death rate. Still, for half of people who have a heart attack, the first time they learn they have heart disease is at the time of that heart attack. And here's the thing. If they can detect it, they can fix it. Coronary artery disease is a fixable condition. Now, something else that's going to be pretty disturbing to the people in the audience is that Rob had one of those treadmill stress tests prior to his death. He actually was very proud because he was one of the few people who could finish the protocol successfully. The final result was that he was healthy. Treadmill stress tests miss 33% of people with significant blockages. Now there are tests that are better, but they're not indicated for young, healthy people. There are actually some really good tests, but they're more invasive, have risks, and still miss 20% of people who have significant blockage. We need something better. Prior to Rob dying, I was working on my PhD in biomedical engineering. My dissertation was to develop a computerized stethoscope. A common technique called auscultation is a, just a fancy word for using a stethoscope. Doctors use a stethoscope to pick out abnormalities associated with lungs, with valves, also with things like your carotid artery. They use auscultation to take your blood pressure as well. Terms like bruise, rattles, and murmurs are often used. So now I'm going to give you an example of what a doctor will hear when using a stethoscope. So the first sound that I'm going to do is a normal. Now I'm going to give you an example of what an abnormal sound sounds like. When I first started this project, I used my husband, Rob, as a test subject. In fact, he was my only test subject. And I collected data from him many, many times. Now, when I received the results of the autopsy and I learned that he died of coronary disease, I knew right then that there was coronary information in those data files. I didn't know where it was. I had no idea how to find it, but 
but I knew that it was there. Now, it's important for me to let you know that my relationship with God is everything to me. I believe that his way is not tragedy, and I also believe that he does not want us to die. So when one night, after one year of doing something called data mining, which is just looking for something in the middle of other things, you don't really know what you're looking for, but you can use statistical techniques to extract information. So one year after doing this, almost every single night, I found an unusual combination of frequencies that I thought would be associated with coronary stenosis. This was validated when I heard the voice of God say, there it is. So I'm a scientist, and I knew that nobody would believe me, okay? I knew they wouldn't believe me. So um, I dug into the medical literature and found a case study of a 49-year-old man who went to a Brooklyn, New York VA hospital. He had severe hypertension, and the doctors did an examination and found an unusual sound that they, they couldn't find the origin of. Unfortunately, this man died two weeks after the sound was detected. They performed an autopsy and discovered that he had died from a widowmaker, the same thing that killed my husband. Now, there have been other case studies that I found in, in the databases, and they all came to the same conclusion. Doctors could not reliably use a stethoscope to pick it out, and so they couldn't use it clinically. Now, my senior software scientist asked me to tell you very clearly how to think about this. Think of the softest sound you can. It's softer. So the murmur is caused by turbulence in the coronary vessels. Regular blood flow is called laminar, which means streamlined, no bump, straight path. When a coronary artery narrows, turbulence results. So I'm gonna play um, the actual sound of a coronary artery for you. So that was a real person, okay? Um, and now what we did was we took out the lub-dub part because it can be a bit distracting and we just kept the wind in so that you could hear the turbulence. So we did the data mining, we did the research, and we put it all together. Using a stethoscope and a computer algorithm that I had written, we took our system out into the hospital to perform some clinical testing. Of course, we had approval from the local institutional review board for the University of Minnesota. And we gathered data on 38 patients who were already undergoing angiogram. Now, angiogram is an invasive method and it's also considered the gold standard to detect coronary artery disease. The idea was that we would take the data prior to the patient undergoing angiogram, and the patient would undergo angiogram, we would take the results from angio, and we would see if our results matched up. What we found was that 75% of the time, we were right in the Widowmaker coronary artery. We were excited but I thought we need to continue the study. We have to take more data so that we're not fooling ourselves. So we studied another 51 patients. We added on to the first study and discovered that 76% of the time we could pick out blockage in the Widowmaker coronary artery. So I say that was the easy part because it took us about three years to characterize the rest of the coronary arteries. So there are four primary arteries that needed to be detected. We needed to be able to pick out disease in them to make our system really usable clinically. So what we did was first of all, we realized we were onto something. And then second of all, we knew we had a lot of work to do. And so we took a more advanced, higher fidelity sensor, which would, would allow us to collect more data, as well as more advanced computational power. And as I mentioned before, after three years, we were able to pick out blockage in all of the major coronary arteries. So at that point, it stopped being a stethoscope, and it started to become cadence. 
So cadence is comprised of a handheld device, it requires us to take eight minutes of data, we wirelessly upload that data to our computer system, and we perform an analytics engine on the data and send the results to the doctor within about 12 minutes. So the full process is 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Cadence is not magic. The data is there. It was always there. We find it in the acoustic nooks and crannies. Right now, we are in the middle of a 1,000 patient clinical study to prove efficacy in the United States. We should be available for the American public by 2017. Let me finish by telling you that the name of my company is Ohm Cardiovascular. Ohm is the ancient Sanskrit syllable that is linked to all sounds and all languages. In many ways, our heartbeat is it's like an unspeakable language that ties us to each other. I've devoted my life to learning this language. On October 17, 2002, Rob's death led to the creation of Cadence. It's a gift to the world from Rob, my team, and from me.